Our guest today is Larry Baldessaro. Uh, Larry comes to us from uh, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, uh, where uh, for many years he taught uh, sports history and other kinds of history as well. And he, uh, the first time I ran into him was many years ago when he was the, uh, a, an aide to uh, the Council General of Chicago in, uh, at, at one event. And uh, times have uh, passed quite quickly and uh, council generals change every few years. We can't even remember what the name of the council general was, but he was very uh, uh, useful in, in uh, helping the council general. Um, Larry has written a, a dozen books that uh, impinge on Italian American uh, uh, Italian Americans in sports. And um, he's famous in my mind for uh, quoting uh, a, a headline from the 1920s uh, sports pages talking about walloping walks uh, uh, on the, I guess, on the Yankees. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to introduce Larry Baldessaro, uh, who is the author of a new book. Um, uh, I've forgotten Lazare's first name, um, but he tell, he'll tell us all about it. Larry? All right. Are you there, Larry? I'm here. Come on down. Okay. Yeah, okay. Nice to see you. Well, it's nice, uh, nice of you to invite me. Okay, so tell us a little bit about yourself and your career in the Italian American field and uh, your Italian bona fides. Well, I'm a grandson of four Italian immigrants. My mother was born in Italy, came over when she was four. Um, I didn't grow up in an Italian community. I was from a small city in Western Massachusetts. 90 miles west of Boston called Chicopee. And uh, some sports enthusiasts might recognize Chicopee, which for many, many decades, until I think about 1980, was world headquarters of A.G. Spalding Sports, which meant oh, that yeah. baseballs, gloves, golfing equipment were made uh, within three miles of my home. Um, that's all I'll say about Chicopee. But, um, yeah, I grew up in Western Mass, went to college in Schenectady, New York, and then graduate school at Indiana University, and uh, got a PhD in Italian, which I wasn't initially planning to do. I was an uh, English major as an undergraduate, and even went to IU as a graduate student in English, thinking I'd be a professor of English. But much to my good fortune, between my junior and senior years in college, I went to Italy for the first time oh, and wow. uh, met my mother's family. I actually slept in the same room where she was born in a farm compound in Abruzzo. So, I mean, I was immediately captivated. I mean, this family, all they knew about me was I was my mother's son. My mother had grown up there or born there. My grandfather was, grew up there. And I, you know, I could have been a serial killer in the United States, but they welcomed me like a long lost son. And so I, I was just, I really got it, a sense of my ethnic identity from that visit. And then of course, from visiting Rome, Venice, Florence, it's and falling in love with the, the culture and the life of Italy. So when I went to graduate school, I uh, was very fortunate to go to Indiana that had a PhD program in Italian. And so I spoke to the head of the Italian program, Mark Musa, who's a distinguished Dante scholar, and told him maybe I could minor in Italian. He said, well, he said, you really should go on our summer or junior year abroad in Bologna to improve your Italian. And I kiddingly said, OK, I'll do that if you pay my way. <laughs> and the son of a gun got me a fellowship to spend the next year at the University of Bologna. And of course the proviso was when I came back, 
I'd now be a student or a PhD in Italian. So that was just timing is everything. And uh, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, soon, as soon as I got out of Indiana, I came here to UW Milwaukee and I was here teaching for 36 years until 2010. And now I'm retired and mainly writing about baseball. I mean, when I was a professor, I really specialized in Dante and medieval literature, but I always loved baseball as my first passion. And I started writing baseball as a hobby. And finally, one day the light went on. Here I am, I'm Italian American, I'm writing about baseball. Why aren't I writing about Italians in baseball? And that's when that started. And uh, that led to uh, my first big book uh, called Beyond DiMaggio, which is a general history of Italian Americans in baseball. And that came out in 2011. And I've been writing about Italian Americans in baseball ever since. Uh -huh. Well, you, you have a, a career similar to Bartlett Chiamaki. I wish. <laughs> hey, I, I was not president of Yale and I haven't been commissioner of baseball, but otherwise we're very similar. <laughs> well, you went from Dante to baseball. Yeah, and he was, he was sort of a role model for me. I mean, I only met him once, but uh, yeah, just a, an amazing figure. And he probably would have been the best baseball commissioner uh, had he lived beyond one year after becoming commissioner, that was a real loss. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, so we have your uh, career there. Um, what about uh, your, uh, the, the, your famous quote about the walloping wops? Uh, what's the, the full quote and where did it come from and who did it, who did it apply to and all that? Well, I, my guess is it applied to a lot of people, but uh, I, since I wrote a book about Tony Lazari, I'm gonna talk about that. Um, when Lazari was a rookie in 1926 at the Yankee spring training camp, and he hit his first home run, there was a headline in Sporting News calling him the Walloping Wop. And um, that nickname stuck with him more or less throughout his career and a lot of other more denigrating Italian uh, nicknames were applied to him. He's routinely referred to as a Dago and a Wop. Um, let, me, let me pose the question this way. For Italian Americans in 2021, why should you be interested in an Italian American ball player who played almost a century ago? Um, and the answer to that is, if he had just been a ball player, I wouldn't have written a book about it takes too much work. But there's so much more about Tony Lazari than being a Hall of Fame baseball player. And the reason I wrote this book, until I started doing that research on Beyond DiMaggio, I didn't know much about Tony Lazari. I mean, I knew he was a Yankee. I knew he was in the Hall of Fame. I knew he played in the 20s and 30s. But um, he became a forgotten figure. But then yeah. I discovered, doing that research, but Tony Lazari was one of the most celebrated sports figures of the 1920s and 30s, one of the most celebrated athletes in America. Um, he was one of the, the third most uh, powerful hitter on that famed murderer's row lineup of the Yankees featuring Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, two iconic players. Um, and he was- Larry. What was his background? What was his family background? Where did he grow up? What did his father do? Well, uh, he, um, his parents were immigrants who came to or went to San Francisco. Uh, and nine months later, Lazari was born, December 6, 1903. And he grew up in the Potrero district of San Francisco, which apparently was a pretty tough neighborhood. Because Lazari told a sports writer years later, he said, it wasn't a neighborhood where you were likely to grow up a sissy because it was either fight or get licked. And I never got licked. And he even became uh, uh, an amateur boxer. He contemplated becoming a professional fighter, but ultimately he turned his, his skill and passion to baseball. But even as a youngster, he was a very skilled athlete. Joe Cronin, a fellow San Franciscan, who went on to become a Hall of Fame ball player like Tony, 
was only two years younger than Luzzeri, but he said he idolized him. He said he was the guy that always scored the winning goal in the soccer game. He scored the winning touchdown in the baseball game. And he always drove in the winning run in, in the football game. And he always drove in the winning run in the baseball game. So he was an outstanding athlete, uh, one of the best young athletes in San Francisco. And he played sandlot ball and then he played semi-professional ball. And it was uh, 1921 when he was playing semi-pro ball that he was signed by the, the Salt Lake City Bees of the Pacific Coast League, which was at that time one of three minor leagues in the country, which had a double A ranking, which at that time was the highest level of the minor leagues. So here he is, an 18 year old kid starting his professional career at the highest level of the major minor leagues. Um, so his first three years in the minor leagues were sometimes good, sometimes very poor. They demoted him twice to a lower league, but he finally came into his own um, in 1925. But let me go back just a second, because Dominic, you asked about his, his, what did his father do? Um, his father worked in an ironworks as a boilermaker. Tony left school, and actually he was, he was invited to leave school when he was 18 years old. He said, I love playing baseball, I love sports, uh, I didn't love school. So he kind of thanked the administration when they asked him to leave. And at the age of 15, he went to work in that same uh, ironworks factory as his father. And he always attributed that hard work to building up the powerful wrists and forearms and enabled them to hit home runs. Um, so anyway, he signs with the Salt Lake City Bees, goes through the first three years of the minors, but comes into his own in 1925. He's the first player in organized baseball, minor or major leagues, to hit 60 home runs in that season. Now, Pacific Coast League, they played almost 200 games. So he played in 197 games that season, but he drove in 222 runs. And both of those records are still Pacific Coast League records almost a century later. But the big thing, hitting those 60 home runs, nobody had ever done that. Babe Ruth in 1921 hit 59. So this was a new organized record okay, uh, I think for we, home runs. Losing them. Now, bandwidth here. having that but, incredible uh, uh, season in 1925, was he the you'd first? assume that and all the major league teams major league? were swarming to sign him. And in fact, they weren't. And there were two reasons. One, Tony Lazzari played his entire professional career while he was afflicted with epilepsy, which meant he faced the daily challenge of having a seizure at any time. How he could play baseball under those conditions is just incredible to me. Um, the other problem, the other reason that a lot of teams wouldn't sign him, he was Italian. And in those days, they didn't sign many Italian players. When Lazzari became a, a Yankee in 1926, there had only been 15 um, Italian Americans who had ever played in the major leagues. And most of those had very short careers. Do we know who the Italian Jackie Robinson was? Well, I wouldn't use that term. <laughs> but if I were asked to use the term, it's Tony Lazzari. I mean, and we'll get to this, but he, I mean, he, he was a major leaguer 10 years before Joe DiMaggio, right? Joe DiMaggio, who was, you know, the iconic figure for Italian Americans. But the, the first line of my preface reads, before there was Joe DiMaggio, there was Tony Lazzari. And so he set the standard for everybody to come after him. Um, so, I, you know, again, teams weren't ready to sign him because part of it was Italian. There's um, one line here I want to read. Lee Monfield, who wrote a biography of Babe Ruth, wrote, other teams stayed away because Lazzari was Italian, a minority not in favor with white old line managers of the game. So he had two strikes against him. He's an epileptic and he was Italian. Well, even the Yankees were skeptical because of the epilepsy primarily, but 
Ed Barrow, the general manager, pursued it. He sent three scouts to check Lazeri out in that season in Salt Lake City. And one of them went to San Francisco to check on his family background and the epilepsy, et cetera, et cetera. And one of those scouts told Barrow, he said, I don't care what he's got, sign him. He's the greatest thing I've ever seen. So in August of 1925, the Yankees purchased his contract from Salt Lake City for $50,000, which was an enormous sum at, wow. that sum at that time, and sent five ball players to Salt Lake City to get this uh, young Italian player. I'm sure that one of the reasons that uh, Barrow was willing to pursue him was because there were roughly a, one million Italians living in New York City, about one seventh of the population. So they knew there was this great untapped audience and bringing in an Italian ball player, if he did well, that might help bring in new fans. And so they took a chance in uh, 1926. Here's 22 year old Tony Lazzari, who'd never seen a major league game in his life. And he's in the starting lineup of the New York Yankees with Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig uh, and several other star players that would end up in the Hall of Fame. And um, you think about a 22-year-old rookie playing in Yankee Stadium before 50, maybe 60,000 people, a young kid like that, what was the pressure he felt that he faced? Um, any rookie coming into baseball is under enormous pressure, but Missouri had more than most. Again, he had the epilepsy to, to be worried about, and he didn't talk about it. You know, at that time, epilepsy was such a stigmatized illness that it was best to keep it secret. And throughout his career, the public never knew about that affliction. The Yankees were able to keep that a secret from the fans. Wow. Lazari lived with it every day, and there was part of the pressure, and again, playing in Yankee Stadium in front of all those fans, um, there was a, the head of the Epilepsy Foundation in New York City was quoted in the New York Times in 1991 saying, playing at that time in front of all those people, she said, and knowing how stress can trigger seizures, she said, I can't we believe have, he played, uh, small, I can't believe he played baseball. You have to repeat. So under this pressure, how is he going to do following up on a season in which he had 60 home runs? Well, in that rookie season, he only hit 18 home runs. But in 1926, 18 home runs mm -hmm. was enough to be third That's in the American funny. League behind Babe Ruth, who was in a league of his own. He hit 47. Yeah. And Al Simmons, Milwaukee native, who hit 19 home runs. And Zeri was second to Babe Ruth in runs batted in. In fact, he set a rookie record of driving in 117 runs that year. So in spite of all that pressure, he got off to a great start and his career just went from there. Okay, uh, so his Italianness ness uh, uh, was a two-edged sword uh, for one thing that Maybe the sports writers characterized him as an Italian walloping wop, but, but the Italian Americans, what was the Italian American response to having Lazzari in the, the light up? To understand, and to me, much more important than what he did on the field was his social impact as the first major star of Italian descent in the sport that dominated sports at that time. You know, there was no question that this was the American game. So you have to put his entry into baseball in 1926 in the historical perspective. What was life like for Italian Americans in 1926? Well, remember that in 1924, just two years before, there was so much virulent anti-immigration sentiment that Congress passed that immigration law that severely limited the number of immigrants who could come from Southern and Eastern European countries. And of course, at that time, the greatest number had been coming from Italy. So there was an obvious manifestation of the anti-Italian sentiment that's so powerful at that time. And 
who did Italian, non-Italian Americans know of Italian descent? Well, obviously the most famous name was Al Capone. So you've got that stereotype of the mobster that had been laid on Italians for decades. So that's another thing that Luzzeri was living with. The uh, two other famous Italian Americans, Sacco and Vanzetti, were waiting in jail to be executed. So how does a kid from San Francisco at 22 years old come into baseball at that time in history and become the idol of Italian Americans? Well, given the, the atmosphere that Italian Americans lived in at that time, all of a sudden they have this young man that Americans are cheering for and admiring in the American game. That gave them a sense of pride and they just idolized those areas. Um, in 1927, they held banquets for them, not just in New York City, but in Boston and Detroit, huge banquets. They'd have a Tony Lazeri day at the ballpark. And then that night they'd have a banquet. The banquet in New York City uh, drew more than a thousand people. And you had all political business dignitaries and so on and so forth. They're celebrating this 22, now 23 year old man who is a star in the biggest sport in America. So he became an idol and you can understand why, because now they had somebody that gave them an incredibly positive image in America, as opposed to what they've been dealing with for all those decades before. Larry, what kind of personality did he have? Was yeah. he shy, quiet, uh, yeah. uh, obnoxious? Uh, you can sum his uh, outward personality by a most famous quote by some sports writer whose identity has been lost. He said, trying to interview Tony Lazeri is like mining coal with a nail file and a comb. Tony just didn't talk much, not even to his friends. Um, and I think possibly one of the reasons he didn't, he was very private was because he kept that secret inside of him of being an epileptic. Now. Quiet, reserved, yes. Trying to interview him, not easy, but he was not aloof. By all indications, he was very well liked by his teammates. Now you gotta again, put this in historical perspective. 1926, if you're a rookie in baseball, the, the people on the team are not likely to welcome you, welcome you with open arms. You know, as a rookie, you were to be seen, not heard, he would do chores for the veterans, et cetera. And if this rookie was coming in and he played the position you were playing as a veteran, he's there to steal your job. You're not gonna do anything to help him. So given that atmosphere, the reception that Lazeri got as a 22 year old kid from his teammates is astounding. Not only was he well liked, he was greatly respected to the extent that he was recognized by his teammates and by the press as the on-field leader of the Yankee team that had Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. How do you explain that for a 22-year-old rookie who didn't speak much? Well, there, there was clearly something about him um, that was appealing. Um, Paul Gallico, who was one of the famous sports writers of the 20s and an Italian-American said that there was something uh, let me pull that up if I can quickly, because yeah, Gallico said there was a gentleness about Tony Lazeri and a warmth that was appealing and endearing. And clearly that was true. If he could win over those teammates as a rookie and have the respect that he was the de facto captain of that team, which next year in the 1927 team, the same team basically is still considered by many the greatest team of all time in baseball, murderous row lineup. Lazeri was the leader of that team on the field. Frank Crusetti, who joined the Yankees in 1932, also from San Francisco, he said Lazeri was not only a great player, he was a great man. He said he was like a manager on the field. So when you put all those things together, um, you know, mm -hmm. hero of Italian Americans. Uh, so, did he Italian, and what uh, 
what part of Italy was his uh, family from? And, and uh, was that a, a part of his popularity with the Italians? No, I don't think, you know, I don't think New York Italians knew much about his family. But they weren't Southern Italians like the vast majority of immigrants were at that time. Um, his mother was from a town uh, just outside of Genoa. And his father was from a small town in the Massacrata area of Tuscany. So there were Northern Italians. Um, was a California Italian. California, yes. And growing up in San Francisco in those days was a lot different from growing up, say, in New York or Boston, et cetera, et cetera. It was a, a much more cosmopolitan atmosphere for Italians. It's true. Yeah, but so he's not in New York. He's not in San Francisco anymore. He's in New York. And did, did he speak Italian? Apparently, you know, he had to. I mean, obviously, whatever dialect his parents spoke, since they had only been in the States nine months when he was born, there's no question that he grew up speaking Italian with them. And some player on another team complained because they said that yeah, when, they, when Corsetti came to the Yankees, Corsetti and Lazari would speak Italian to each other and they couldn't understand them. So clearly he spoke some Italian, but to what extent? Again, he, he just never talked about those things. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, very good. And you probably have uh, stats from his career and you've already mentioned that the uh, minor league home run record of 60 in 200 games. Uh, there any other... Uh, uh, Hall of Fame, uh, hard to distinguish himself from those high achievers. Um, as I said, he had that great rookie year. He got better in the next couple of years. His best all around year was 1929 when he set career records in most of his offensive categories. He was so good. At that point, after his first four years in the majors, and one writer said, if he continues on this track, he'll be remembered as one of the all-time greats with Ty Cobb, Honus Wagner, uh, Babe Ruth. That's how mm. good he was. Now, he was a second baseman. So there was a, a quality about Lazari. He was a pioneer. That's why the part of the subtitle of my book is a baseball pioneer. Not only was he the first, he had 60 home runs in professional baseball, he was one of the very first middle infielders in the major leagues to hit with power. And of course, he was the first major Italian star. So he was a pioneer in all those senses. So as I say, he gets off to a Hall of Fame career in his first four seasons. And then in 1931 and 32, suddenly he hits a speed bump especially in, in uh, 1932, his record goes way down. And there was no injury that was reported to explain the sudden drop off from this magnificent first four years in his career, no injury. So how do you explain that? Like precipitous fall off, especially in 1932. Uh, well, given the lack of any proof of an of an injury, I have to wonder, at the very least wonder, if it was the epilepsy that was causing this. I interviewed a doctor here at the Medical College of Wisconsin who's an expert in epilepsy. He said, you know, you can go through periods when it's very good. You don't have many seizures, they're mild. Okay, yeah. Then you can go through periods when it's very bad, more seizures, stronger seizures, um, and that can debilitate you weakens your muscles, it makes you fatigue, it slows your reflexes. All of that would be logical evidence of why Lazari suddenly, he started, in those years he had half as many home runs as he had hit every other year before them. So his power numbers went down, which is really significant that there was something um, which made, and he was considered one of the strongest men in baseball. Now look, this guy, he was five feet, 10 inches tall, okay? He weighed 160 okay. to 165. 
Babe Ruth in his prime weighed about 215. Lou Gehrig weighed about 200 pounds. And here's another thing. When you think about Zeri hitting the home runs he did, he was a right-handed hitter in Yankee Stadium. Ruth and Gehrig were left-handers. Well, the average distance to left field wall in Yankee Stadium at that time was 401 feet. Not to dead center, but to left center. The distance in right center where Gehrig and Ruth were aiming was 346 feet. Oh, so the fact okay. That, the fact that Tony hit all of those home runs in Yankee Stadium gives you proof of the how strong he was. So suddenly that power goes away for those two seasons. And then in 1933, he bounces back. So I, there is no proof of this because again, they, nobody talked about epilepsy, but I did see several vague references in those years in the press to an illness. One writer said, Tony's in his 12th year as a professional ball player but his health isn't always good. Well, what does that mean? Why don't you tell us what the issue is? And because they wouldn't, I have to believe that the epilepsy really caused uh, that brief breakdown in his career because then he bounced back. 1936, this is a year before his final year with the Yankees. He played from 26 to 37. 1926, he had such a great year that the Italian branch, <laughs> the New York branch of the Baseball Writers Association of America named him the Major League Player of the Year. And in that season, 1936, on May 24th in Philadelphia, Tony Lazzari became the first player in Major League history to hit two grand slams in the same game. Wow. He hit another home run, a solo home run and a triple he drove in 11 runs in that one game, which still today is the American League all-time record for RBIs in one game. That's fantastic. Oh. Now, there's no record of him having a, an episode in public or at a game or in the dugout or anything like that. Of a, a seizure? Yes. No. One of the reasons uh, that Ed Barrow, the general manager, was uh, willing to sign Lazarius, the report he got from the scout that went out to San Francisco said that he seems to only have his seizures in the mornings. And they mm -hmm. played baseball games at, at that time at 3.30 in the afternoon. And Barrow said, okay, as long as he isn't gonna have seizures in the afternoon, we can sign him. Um, yes, there were reports, um, his, his fellow, his teammates had to know because if he had a seizure, especially his roommates, they had to know, know what to do. And he told them, you know, you put a towel in my mouth so I don't swallow my tongue, um, keep me lying down, and it lasts about four or five minutes. But these were grand mall seizures. They were pretty bad. And I must have come across five or six descriptions um, with roommates or on a train where he, he would ride with one player who specifically would take care of him if he did have one. And I think the general manager did talk about uh, one seizure in the locker room, but never, never on the ball field, never during a game. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Uh, so uh, finally, uh, what, what about his retirement? Uh, what, how, what's the story on that? It's 1937, you say? He retired? Well, 37 was his last year with the Yankees and uh, that was the low point of his career in terms of his productivity. But in 38, he was signed by the Dodgers mm -hmm. as a, uh, well, he was signed by, I'm sorry, 1938 was signed by the Chicago Cubs as a player coach. So he spent the whole 38 season with the Cubs, um, didn't get to play too much. And then in uh, 39, he was signed by the Dodgers play uh, in the infield and he was let go after about two months and then signed by the Giants in the same capacity and he was let go again I think in June but then he was hired to manage uh, the Montreal team uh, in the minor leagues in the international league and uh, I'm sorry the, 
Toronto, the Toronto Blue Jays team in the uh, International League. So he, the rest of the 39 season and all of the 40 season he was managing in Toronto. Um, and then he played one season back in the Pacific Coast League with his hometown San Francisco Seals. And that was very common in those days. A lot of major leaguers who went east to play in the big leagues who came from San Francisco would come back after they left the big leagues and play for one, two, three years in the Pacific Coast League. And, and Tony did that. And then uh, he ended up managing two more years in the minor leagues. And uh, his uh, in uniform career came to an end in 1943. And then so he's uh, living in San Francisco. He had a wife and a child. Um, he became co-owner of a uh, cocktail lounge in San Francisco uh, in the uh, Navi old neighborhood of San Francisco. Um, he was a passionate golfer. He joined. Now, here's another thing about living in San Francisco as opposed to a big Eastern city as an Italian American. He was a passionate golfer and a very good golfer. He was accepted in the Olympic Club of San Francisco, which was at the time and may still be, for all I know, one of the most exclusive country clubs in America. And here's Tony Lazzari. In the 19th century, Mark Twain was a member of that club. And William Randolph Hearst. And now here's Tony Lazzari, the WAP, the Dago. But that, that gives you an impression, again, of the more cosmopolitan life of San Francisco for Italians, but also the level of acceptability uh, that Tony had risen to as a ball player. Even in 1928, his third year in the league, right? Lucky Strike Cigarettes started the most ambitious cigarette ad campaign there had ever been. They chose five major leaguers to be part of that campaign. Uh, and they were the, the Wayner brothers, Paul and Lloyd, Harry Heilman and Lefty Grove and Tony Lazzari, a, 20, a young 23, 24 year old Italian American did a national ad campaign. He was appearing in Life Magazine. He had a full page ad on the back cover of Life magazine. He was on other magazines. Um, that says a lot about his level of assimilation Lucky within the American public as a well whole at that time. Back. Right. I, I didn't I thought you were asking a question, Don. I'm sorry. Yeah, you were breaking up uh, uh, if you could repeat the, that stuff about the ad I uh, just quoted the uh, slogan, lucky strike means fine tobacco, that uh, was a possible uh, tagline for them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did, he did several different ads, usually in a uniform or sometimes uh, just like an a image of a baseball card in front of a pack of luckies. And he would say how mild and sweet they were, things like that, typical you know, cigarette ads were the big thing for athletes in the 20s and 30s. Um, but again, no other Italian was doing anything like that in this country at that time. I think, I think you can make a strong argument that both as the hero of Italian Americans at that time, he brought in for the first time uh, just what I think Ed Barrow was hoping for. He created an entirely new fan base of Italian Americans. Italian immigrants, the vast majority of them were at best indifferent to baseball and often opposed to it because they didn't want their kids playing ball. Either they wanted them to go out and get an education or go to work and bring in money for the family. But baseball, I remember one guy who played in the 30s told me when he told his father he wanted to be a professional yeah, ball player, that's he a says, truism you're going to become a bum because they just, they had no, they didn't understand the game. The only sport they brought from Italy was bocce. So all of a sudden, again, this young man comes along and with all these Americans admiring and cheering for him, the Italians started flocking, not just to Yankee Stadium, but to any ballpark in America where the Yankees played. Um, they, he created this entirely new fan base, not Joe DiMaggio. Again, DiMaggio is such an iconic figure that even a lot of historians have written Joe DiMaggio brought Italians to the ballpark. Of course he did. But 10 years after Luzeri first drew them in. 
And mm. because he was so admired, because he had this strong work ethic, because he was a leader, even as a 22 year old rookie, and because he had great modesty as a great star, I believe he changed the way that a lot of Americans viewed Italian Americans at that time. It's possible that Lazzari did more than anyone before him to enhance the public perception of Italian Americans. Can you prove that? Absolutely not. But I think a case can be made for it. Uh, what about his uh, family life? Or was he Mitchell? I, I'm sorry, it's breaking up and I couldn't get the whole question. Oh, family life for, for uh, Tony. Was he a, a family man or well, Babe Ruth yes. type or what? No, I mean, he got married actually um, when he was 19, 21, 20 years old. Um, in his second year in the uh, minor, not his first year in the minor leagues, they were going to ship him off to Peoria. Uh, in a class B league because he got off to a bad start his first year. And he had met a young woman, Mary uh, Janes, uh, May Janes in San Francisco, who was the uh, sister-in-law of one of his teammates as a semi-pro player. And he fell in love with her. And when Salt Lake City was gonna send him to Peoria, he proposed to her, he says, I'm not gonna go if you don't come with me. She was just under 18 years old. So they got married and uh, she went with them to Peoria and then everywhere else after that. They had a son that was born in December of 1931. Um, David, who was always known in the family as Tony Jr. And um, the sad part is that uh, Tony Lazeri died at the age of 42 in 1946. Oh, and wow. One of the many mysteries about Lazari's life that was hard to track down was the exact, there were misconceptions about where he grew up in San Francisco, um, got his name wrong many times. I'm also convinced that his real birth name wasn't Anthony Michael Lazari, but Antonio Michele because his parents, nine months after coming to the States, were they going to name their son Anthony? The grandfather's name in Italy was Antonio. And of course, that's the tradition. You name after the, uh, the first male son after the paternal grandfather. So, of course, his birth certificate is gone because of the San Francisco earthquake and fire. Even his, his son wasn't sure about his name. He thought his middle name might have been Michael. He said, it. I know it started with an M. And yet, when uh, his father had to fill out a, uh, an affidavit when Lazari was going to Toronto to manage the minor leagues, he put his, his middle name on that application as Marco, not as Michael. So all these confusions about Lazari. And one of them was where he died and how he died. His wife and uh, son and he had moved from Milbray, which is about 20 miles south of San Francisco, they moved back into San Francisco, uh, I think in 1940. So they were living in San Francisco when he died, no question about that. And yet some papers, when they printed the first editions of, had him dying in Milbray in the old home. And how did he die? Well, here's a brief story for that. As I said, he was the co-owner of a, a cocktail lounge and he and his family had gone up uh, to Russian River, north of San Francisco, to a vacation. But Tony came home early because he, he didn't just have his name on this uh, cocktail lounge. He was there to mingle with the crowd and so forth. So he had called in this morning. He had come home alone. He's back to San Francisco, called in and told the employees he'd be there in about an hour. And he didn't show up. And they tried calling. And they tr tried calling the next day, no answer. So they called the wife up in Russian River. She and her brother-in-law came back, San Francisco, went into the home and found Tony dead 
at the foot of the stairs. So now the newspapers are writing that he fell and hit his skull on the head and that's who killed him. No, you look at the medical report, there's no injury affiliated with it. Is it possibly had a epileptic seizure that caused the heart attack? That's possible. But when I showed the death certificate to the doctor here, he said, this doesn't conclusively prove that it was a heart attack that killed him. He said, there's something called sudden unexpected death by epilepsy. He says, we use that determination only when we have no other evidence of the actual cause of death. So any one of those things, the heart attack caused by a seizure or the SUDEP death, but the newspapers had all kinds of hypotheses and so forth. Um, so one of the mysteries about his, many, many mysteries about his life and the sad fact that he died so young. Why, when I did all this research and we discovered how famous he was, how celebrated he was by his contemporaries, I'm thinking, why has he disappeared? Why does nobody know about this man? I felt like I had discovered this buried treasure of baseball history. And the truth is, as great as he was, as great as his achievements were, as time passed, those achievements were overshadowed by those of his iconic teammates, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, and later Joe DiMaggio. So the fact that he died in 46 and he's been out of the public consciousness for more than seven decades, another reason why he's not really well remembered. And that's when I decided this man's story needs to be told. It's too important a story not to be chronicled and put into historical perspective. Okay, does he appear in any movies? Um, yeah, he did. He did make a, at least one that I know of. I mean, he was just a baseball player in a movie uh, about another baseball player, a fictional story. But um, I think I think that's the only one he was in. But no one ever made a movie about him. No. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, my uh, signal is unstable. So I'm going to pass it on to uh, Carla Simonini, uh, the uh, moderation. Oh, thank you so much for this fascinating presentation. I, I mean, this was so interesting, so much of thank what you, you talked about. Grazie. Um, yeah, no, grazie. Um, at this point, we usually open it up to questions. I'm sure, I know I have a few, but I'd like to open it up and see if anybody else out there has something that they'd like to ask you. So uh, I have a couple questions I'd like to ask Larry. Okay, go ahead. Um, Larry, in your research, did you come across a, a ball player, actually um, also an Italian star from San Francisco who preceded uh, Lazeri, named Ping Bodhi? Yes. Um, I, I think you could make a case for him. I mean, he didn't reach the levels of Lazeri, but uh, he, he had... Um, what uh, it hit 30 home runs in the PCL Pacific Coast League as early as 1910. It was then so signed by the White Sox and became quite a star in Chicago. He had his own newspaper column. He had a vaudeville contract and he eventually was traded to Philadelphia. Then New York. Babe Ruth's roommate. We're trying to you can see the play until 1927 in the minor leagues where he hit uh, 347. Um, so I'm wondering if. Um, you know, obviously the, the chronology there is, and like I said, he probably didn't reach the, the uh, levels that um, um, Tony Lazeri did, but he certainly reached the level of stardom in, at least in Chicago, if not in New York. Oh, I, I, in New York too, I think. I mean, uh, Ping Bodhi, you, Francesco Pezzolo. Yeah, his father <laughs> disowned him for English. His real name, too, Francesco yeah. Pezzolo. Ping Bodhi because, and this one is, I think, uh, a little spurious. Ping Bodhi because the sound the ball made coming off his bat. Well, I played baseball for many years and I've watched baseball for many more years. I've never heard a ball coming off a wooden bat sounding like a ping. Yeah. Aluminum bats, yes, but yeah. a wooden bat, eh. Bodhi because his family had lived for a time in the uh, gold rush city of Bodhi uh, before they moved to San Francisco. So that's where the and why did he play under the name of Ping Bodhi? Because he would have been embarrassed at that time to 
go under his Italian name. He was afraid of being made fun of. And one writer even wrote, he said um, that it was a good idea that he was known as Ping Bodhi because Francesco Pizzolo wouldn't look well in a box score. Yeah. So yeah, Ping was, I, I would say, the first well, very well-known uh, major leaguer of Italian descent. Um, and he was a character. Some writers have said he's known, he was better known for his character than for his ability on the field, but he did have some good years with the White Sox. Then he went to the Yankees. And of course the famous line about Ping Bodie, he was rooming with Babe Ruth, I think for the, his first year, part of it. And a reporter said, what's it like rooming with the babe? And Bodie supposedly said, I don't room with the babe, I room with his suitcase. Yeah because the babe was never in his room. He was always out on the town. But yeah, Ping Bodhi was an important figure. Um, he clearly never reached the um, stature as a ball player uh, that would have made him a hero to uh, Italian Americans or Americans that, that Tony Lazzari would, would become. But yeah, he was, a, he was an important figure in uh, early Italians in baseball for sure. Okay, my, my other question is, uh, so many Italian-American ballplayers came out of San Francisco. Why do you think it was such a hotbed for baseball at that time? Uh, Tony Lazzari was very fortunate to grow up in San Francisco for that very reason. First of all, was, there was the climate, of course. I think it played basically all year round. Um, um, Alexander Cartwright, who you know was attached to the and Knickerbockers in New York, who some people think or thought were the first real baseball team and so forth. He moved to San Francisco for a while. And some have written that he brought baseball to San Francisco, but I've read other articles that dispute that it was there before him. In any case, for whatever reason, San Francisco became an incredible hotbed of amateur baseball, California as a whole, but primarily San Francisco. I, what all the reasons are, why they're specifically, hard to say, but um, you know, if you grew up in San Francisco and were a ball player, you had so many opportunities to play all over the city. You know, the DiMaggio's and others grew up in the North Beach area and the North Beach playground was like two blocks from where the DiMaggio family grew up. So that's where you know, Dom, Dom DiMaggio and Joe, and all three brothers, uh, started playing ball. So San Francisco was just, um, you know, they had minor leagues very early on. Um, it was, it, somebody wrote that it was, you know, the sand, the, the term sandlot actually originated in San Francisco. I assume that's true. I believe that historian, but it, yeah, it was just incredibly popular uh, and a great place to play baseball. So many, virtually all of the early Italian American ball players that went to the major leagues were from San Francisco or Oakland. You know, Ernie Lombardi, a great ball player, um, and, uh, Gino Simoli, Le um, Billy Martin growing up in Oakland. Um, so many of them, of the early ball players, went from San Francisco to the big leagues. Thank you. That's very interesting too, because there's so much that's been said about um, the different experience of Italians in in California, as opposed to on the East Coast, and the greater degree of uh, integration and success they had. You know, the big example that's always brought up is uh, Giannini and the and the Bank of America. So I wonder if that yeah. has something to do with it also, um, as in addition to the availability of baseball. So, so I think uh, Maria Rosaria has a question for you. Next. Oh yes, thank you, Carla. Well, I was listening very closely and many compliments, um, Lawrence, for your presentation. And I was reminded of um, characters like Ron Santo, Joe Pepitone, playing for Chicago Cubs. Um, those were the guys that we were so proud to be Italian. And this was the 70s when, you know, there was some prejudice about Italians. My question for you is, an educational one, it's about school. Um, what do you think um, the relationship is, if there is one, between school achievement and sports? 
Well, again, that needs some historical perspective. Today, in certain sports, really, you know, playing in college is going to give you a big, if you want to become a professional ball player with basketball, football, particularly, and somewhat lesser in baseball, um, you go to college, you know, more, more players now, I think, are signed out of college and out of high school. So it's clearly a stepping stone. But back in the days when Lazeri was playing, uh, that was a whole different thing. Um, most ball players didn't go to college. Some did. Some did go to college. Um, but the vast majority didn't. And if they did, went to college, again, their families that encouraged them to go to college wanted them to get an education to make a living, not to become a ball player, because that wasn't going to get you there. You know, or if they didn't want you to get an education. They needed you to go to work to help support the family. So education and sports back in the, that era, uh, there wasn't a real strong connection. And again, in the case of Lazeri, um, you know, he left at the age of 15 and he, Joe DiMaggio wasn't a big on school and so forth and so on. So there, there's a big difference over time as to uh, how much of a stepping stone to a professional sporting career there is through education, uh, not so much back then. Grazie. Yeah. Prego. Are there any other questions out there? Just, uh, just speak up. Well, if not, I'll, I have one. Yeah, I do. I do. Oh, I'm Hello? sorry. Go ahead. I'm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, was there any uh, disproportionate involvement uh, Italian Americans by position? Just uh, off the top of my head, several uh, uh, you know catchers were uh, you know famous: uh, Garagiola, Berra, uh, and uh, oh, on and on and on. Um, I, I have a list. Of, Piazza, well, that's later on, but uh, early on. Um, uh, and uh, not as many pitchers just come to mind. Are you, is there any, uh, any, uh, any bias or disproportionality there by position? Yeah, there have been some historians have done studies on not just Italians, but other ethnic groups and that very question, you know, what positions they play and why. And it is true when you think of Italians, you tend to think of catchers because you've had Lombardi, Berra, Piazza all the way through. But I think there really is a sense of bias involved in this in the same way that for a long time, um, football coaches didn't think that African-Americans would make good quarterbacks. Yeah. And there the bias is obvious. I suspect there was some of that with regard to Italians as well. And if that bias was there ingrained, it seems to me that as a kid, you might be less inclined to want to become a pitcher because you figure, hey, you don't have the role models and there seems to be, you know, coaches maybe guiding you to other positions. Again, is there specific evidence of that? I doubt it, but I think uh, there's no question the element of bias plays a role in that. Um, that you know, I think, I don't think there was a domination of catchers because you had infielders, you had outfielders and you had catchers, but fewer pitchers until later on. So I, I think that was a, a big part of it, the ethnic bias. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking of. And if, uh, if so, who, who would the pitchers be that began to, to change that? Um, or, or were there any that um, kind of, uh, if there was a, you know, a, a barrier uh, that kind of uh, confronted that barrier? Um, being from New York, Sal Magley got a lot of attention way back. Yes. And um, uh, I, I'm not aware of any others, so. In the post-war period, there were, there were quite a few. I mean, you had Magley, you had Vic Rashi, who was the most important Yankee pitcher in that post-war era when they seemed to win the World Series every year. Um, um, Johnny Antonelli. But in the pre-war era, um, the Yankees did have Marius Russo, 
who was a, a good, pretty good pitcher. Um, in fact, he lived very close to Phil Rizzuto and they would drive to the ballpark together. So Marius Russo, he didn't have a long career, but he was one of the early Italian-American pitchers to have success. And there was another guy, Vic Lombardi, who pitched for the Dodgers and had a good deal of success. But um, there's no one who stands out as the pioneer that I can think of or that I'm aware of. But certainly in that uh, post-war era, you did have several uh, great pitchers of Italian descent. Thank you very much. Larry, Larry uh, I have a couple of questions. One is, are you familiar with J uh, Bart Giamatti's writing on baseball? Do you know? Oh, yeah. So how do you see his romanticism, you know, the connection to the Renaissance and all that, uh, compared to the very realism of your work? In other words, you, you are somebody who can stuff sentences with statistics and make them readable. I mean, mo mostly the way I read statistics and the way I learned, e even the way I learned how to do, uh, I couldn't learn how to do percentages in the classroom. But once I figured out that batting averages dependent on your ability, I mean, that's, I picked it up immediately. Right. But, but, but the idea of, um, you know, being able to put, I mean, typically I would read statistics like on the back of baseball cards and in, 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 in tables. But throughout your whole book, you, you, I mean, you must have taken all those tables and turned them into sentences is what I, is the way I see it. And, and that to me is a great work of translation. Well, go back to your mention of uh, Bart Giamatti, who, as I mentioned earlier, was sort of a bit of a role model for me as an Italian American, uh, as an academic. Um, to me, Bart Giamatti was the most eloquent spokesperson the game of baseball has ever or ever will have. I mean, you read his writings and yes, they are romantic. He was an idealist, but my God, he knew and understood the game and put it, could put it into such beautiful language um, that again, the fact that he died a year after he became commissioned is a tremendous loss. To me, he was the, if you look at the history of Italian Americans in baseball, Bart Giamatti is the summation of that. He's the culmination, you know, going from the early guys in the minor leagues and struggling and playing for a couple of years, and then being dropped, et cetera. And then you come full circle to a man who's the president of Yale, gives up that job, which any academic would die to have, to become president of the National League of Baseball. Because he had always said, when he was named president of Yale, he said, the only thing I really wanted to be president of was the American League in baseball. Well, he got close. He got the National League. In fact, the headline in the New York Times uh, when he got that job that said from Dante to Darling because he had Ron Darling pitching for the Mets at the time. So yeah, Dem um, Giamatti just was the epitome of, of expressing the beauty of the game. And he put it in terms of Italian American immigration and you know, when I taught or teach Dante, I would sneak some baseball in there because, you know, you've got the whole idea of, and Jamadi writes about this, of leaving home to try to come back home. You know, you, you leave a home hoping to find a new home. Well, Dante's writing about leaving home and trying to get back to your place of origin, et cetera, et cetera. The number three, the numbers nine, there's such a connection there. And Jamadi had that in his writing about baseball and linking it to the Italian-American experience, the immigrant experience, like no one ever has. So um, if you were to ask me a question and you know, talk about my writing in the same sentence as Mark Giamatti is you know, beyond imagination. I'm not saying you are doing that, but uh, you know, Giamatti was the epitome. No, but and, what, what I'm basically saying is that your, yours is, this is very romantic, whereas yours is very realist. Yeah. Um, well, okay. That's because I don't have the, the linguistic skill to write like Bart Giamatti. <laughs> no, but I don't, I don't think, I think if you would have given Tony Lazzari to Bart Giamatti, he would have, he would have been rhapsodic about it as opposed to giving us the facts. I mean, you're a baseball yeah. writer. I mean, and that's, to me, that, that you know, that's, that's the thing. And, and that leads to my next question, which is, 
All right, you've done the overall view of Italian American, a, a baseball Italian American style. You did the uh, Beyond DiMaggio. You did the uh, ethnic uh, uh, book, and now you've done a single study of Lazzari. You're not done. What's next? Oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I never expected to write the book on Lazzari until I discovered him and had some time to recover from writing Beyond DiMaggio. Uh, I don't have anything in mind. I used to think that if I were to, I cut it down to two people. It's interesting you bring this up about who would I want to write a biography of that was in baseball. Mazzari was one and Jamadi was the other. But I realized I could never write a biography of Jamadi because I wouldn't want to go through that stuff at Yale University and, you know, the fight, the labor fight. I couldn't and wouldn't want to write about that. So Lazzari was the clear choice. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, I don't have any other big project in mind. You know, I write brief biographies for the Sabre Bio Project and mm -hmm. things like that. But um, we'll see I mean, what I, pops I'd, in. I'd like to see what you'd have to say about Italian American sports writers. Sports uh, writer, like Gallico, yeah. especially Gallico, because Gallico, yeah, yeah. Gallico, to me, you know, he wrote some of the, the best baseball books I read. You know, as a kid. And, yes. um, but he also, I mean, what you made me, what you brought attention to in your book to me was his ability to, you know, I mean, his sports writing of the era where he's using the ser same terminology as the other uh, uh, sports writers, and yet he's Italian American. So I wonder if he was doing that because that was expected, accepted. Uh, how, how did he feel about it? I mean, I don't know. Is there a, is there a biography of Gallico? If there is, I'm not aware of it. No. Uh, but there's a lot of other Italian-American sports writers. I think it would be interesting to, to just to take a look. Maybe it wouldn't be a book. Maybe it'd be just an article. Perhaps. And I, I did a very lengthy essay on, uh, and he's not Italian, but Red Smith. Right. He's you know, one of the great sports writers, one of the great prose writers of the 20th century for a book on uh, 20th century sports writers. But, uh, and I love it. It was fun doing, but uh, it wasn't Italian. Well, I just like reading your work. I want to make sure there's more of it in the future for me to read. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that, Fred. I think there's going to be a lot of people reading your work after this, too. You've sparked a lot of interest, for sure. So. Well, let me just say this. Uh, I started writing about baseball because I love it. Mm -hmm. And I've written these books, you know, it's a cliche, but they really were a labor of love. Mm. And, and I want a lot of people to buy and read this book because I want them to know who Tony Lazzari was and how important he was to the Italian American history mm -hmm. experience. And I don't mind pushing the book because whatever royalties I earn, I donate to the Jimmy Fund, which is Oh, you know, I'm not a I'm, I'm a Red Sox fan by birth. Yeah. Oh, so Jimmy am I. <laughs> All right. The Jimmy Fund is the fundraising arm of the Dana Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. And as a kid, my hero was Ted Williams. And I'm old enough to have gone to movies when they had double features. And between A and B, Ted would appear on the screen because the Red Sox were the official sponsors of the Jimmy Fund. He would appear on the screen and make a pitch for the Jimmy Fun, and then the ushers would come through the theater passing the canisters around to make donations. So that's been my charity since I was a little kid. So buy the book, it's not going into my pocket, but you need to know about Tony Lazzari if you're an Italian American. Oh, that, right. That's wonderful. Do we have any other questions out there? Oh, Giuseppe. I uh, may have a question, Mr. Baldassaro. Eh, parlo in italiano, va così. Sì, sì. Allora, io ovviamente le faccio i complimenti per questa bella presentazione. Grazie. Naturalmente, io parlando dall'Italia, non questo è uno sport sconosciuto. Si sì. conosce soltanto Gio Di Maggio. Se io chiedo a qualcuno dei miei amici chi è Tony Lazzaro non, nessuno dice non lo conosco quindi è uno sport sconosciuto non si conoscono le regole 
non ci sono campi eh, per esempio nella mia città c'è un campo di rugby ma non c'è un campo di baseball perché mm. non c'è forse non c'è nemmeno un campionato in Italia di baseball. no no c'è c'è ah, c'è c'è un campionato oh, sì, sì. Ecco. da molti anni da molti, molti anni, anni. Sì. Eh, forse da, a Roma a, a Roma forse no dappertutto ah, sì. il baseball è stato introdotto uh, su, durante la guerra la seconda guerra quando ci sono stati i soldati uh, e hanno insegnato ai giovani italiani di giocare baseball. E pian piano è cresciuto, è cresciuto. E c'è un sito in Italia, deve guardare, baseball.it. Baseball.it. C'è uno okay. che si chiama, questo nome è, è vero nome, non è un, un, un uh, soprannome. Filippo Fantasia ah, eh, Filippo ha creato Fantasia. questo sito e lui ha fatto un bel uh, uh, articolo sul mio libro di Lazzari. Se, se vai a quel sito trovi il, il suo articolo. Ah, eh, bene, grazie. La domanda mia è questa. Io ho letto brevemente che Tony Lazzara era affetto da epilessia. Sì. Eh, allora, sua, questo suo handicap... Lo ha, diciamo, condizionato durante il, la sua carriera oppure no? E se la sua morte, che è un po' misteriosa, mi pare di aver capito, sì. forse è dovuta a un attacco di epilessia pure. Ecco, è, è possibile. Domanda. Sì, come ho, ho cercato di spiegare che non sanno di preciso se ha avuto un attacco e questo attacco ha creato un colpo di cuore, un infarto ma non è sicuro, ma è una possibilità. Ma lui ha giocato tutta la carriera con epilepsia. Incredibile. E questo medico di cui ho parlato prima, qui a Wisconsin, che non è un um, tifoso di baseball, ma lui ha detto, io non capisco come mai un perso una persona con epilepsia potrebbe giocare a quel livello. In English, <laughs> just <laughs> for those of you who didn't follow that, the doctor here at the medical college, who's not a baseball fan, he said, I don't know how someone with epilepsy could play baseball at that level, how you could hit a fastball, et cetera, et cetera. And he's, I think it's incredible. I think that so many things about this area are just mind boggling that he was able to do what he did under the circumstances of his ethnicity, and his illness, um, this fantastic career, fantastic person, I think. No, that Thank really you, came honey. across in your presentation. I, I was thinking the Thank same you. thing, yeah. So we have another question out there. I hear someone talking. Yes, no? I don't hear it. Okay, I just, I didn't want to leave anyone out. So uh, um, Dominic, are we, are we at the end of our time here? Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, time to close. Uh, we want to give uh, Larry a chance for one last shot, a summary of your message uh, and uh, your book. I think you've done it a couple of times, but do it again. Well, I think in what I just said, when you're saying before you came on the screen is the summation that, again, I said before, I couldn't have written a book. But I'd never written a biography. When I got into it, I felt a real sense of responsibility that you have to get this right, as right as you can, um, and do justice to the memory of this man who's been forgotten, and perhaps help restore him to his rightful place in baseball history. But he was so much more than a, a Hall of Fame baseball player. That's what I hope that readers will take away from this, um, not just Italian-American readers, but what an important figure he was, the social impact he had at that time in history. That's what I hope readers will take away more than anything. Thank you very much, Larry Baldessari. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. And thank you all for joining in and sticking out uh, this long. I really appreciate it. A lot of oh, fun. Thank you so much. It was so interesting. Is there a link to where we can purchase the book? Is it available on Amazon? Or does Dominic have that information to share with yeah, us? Yeah, no, it, everything's on Amazon, of course. Okay. Or you could go to the University of Nebraska Press Mm -hmm. uh, their website, it's available there. There are discounts, I think, on both sites now. Mm -hmm. It's available hardback, uh, 
Kindle, yeah, Barnes and Noble, 